Chapter One of David Copperfield, as condensed by the author for his dramatic readings in America, by Charles Dickens. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Chapter One. I had known Mr. Peggotty's house very well in my childhood, and I am sure I could not have been more charmed with it if it had been Aladdin's palace, rock's egg and all. It was an old black barge, or boat, high and dry, on Yarmouth's sands, with an iron funnel sticking out of it for a chimney. There was a delightful door cut in the side, and it was roofed in, and there were little windows in it. It was beautifully clean, and as tidy as possible. There was some lockers and boxes, and there was a table, and there was a Dutch clock, and there was a chest of drawers, and there was a tea tray with a painting on it, and the tray was kept from tumbling down by a Bible, and the tray, if it had tumbled down, would have smashed a quantity of cups and saucers and a teapot that were grouped around the book. On the walls were colored pictures of Abraham, in red, going to sacrifice Isaac, in blue, and of Daniel in yellow, being cast into a den of green lions. Over the little mantel-shelf was a picture of the Sarah Jane lugger, built at Sunderland, with a real little wooden stern stuck on it, a work of art combining composition with carpentry which I had regarded in my childhood as one of the most enviable possessions the world could afford. Mr. Peggotty, as honest a seafaring man as ever breathed, dealt in lobsters, crabs, and crawfish, and a heap of those creatures in a state of wonderful conglomeration with one another, and never leaving off pinching whatever they laid hold of, were usually to be found in a little wooden outhouse where the pots and kettles were kept. As in my childhood, <laughs> so in these days, when I was a young man, Mr. Peggotty's household consisted of his orphan nephew, Ham Peggotty, a young shipwright, his adopted niece, little Emily, once my small sweetheart, now a beautiful young woman, and Mrs. Gummidge. All three had been maintained at Mr. Peggotty's sole charge for years and years, and Mrs. Gummidge was the widow of his partner in a boat who had died poor. She was very grateful, but she would have been more agreeable company in a small habitation if she had hit upon any other acknowledgment of the hospitality she received than constantly complaining as she sat in the most comfortable corner by the fireside that she was a lone lorn creature and everything went contrary with her towards this old boat i walked one memorable night with my former schoolfellow and present dear friend, Steerforth. Steerforth, half a dozen years older than I, brilliant, handsome, easy, winning, whom I admired with my whole heart, for whom I entertained the most romantic feelings of fidelity and friendship. He had come down with me from London, and had entered, with the greatest ardor, into my scheme of visiting the old simple place and the old simple people. There was no moon, and as he and I walked on the dark wintry sands toward the old boat, the wind sighed mournfully. This is a wild place, Steerforth, is it not? A dismal enough in the dark. <laughs> and the sea has a cry in it, as if it were hungry for us. Is that the boat where I see a light yonder? That's the boat. We said no more as we approached the light, 
but made softly for the door. I laid my hand upon the latch, and, whispering Steerforth to keep close to me, went in, and I was in the midst of the astonished family whom I had not seen from my childhood, face to face with Mr. Peggotty, and holding out my hand to him, when Ham shouted, "'Master Davy! It's Master Davy!' In a moment we were all shaking hands with one another, and asking one another how we did, and telling one another how glad we were to meet, and all talking at once. Mr. Peggotty was so overjoyed to see me, and to see my friend, that he did not know what to say or do, but kept over and over again shaking hands with me, and then steer forth, and then with me, and then ruffling his shaggy hair all over his head, and then laughing with such glee and triumph that it was a treat to see him. Why, that you two gentlemen, <laughs> gentlemen, Groat, should come to this here roof tonight, <laughs> of all nights in my life, is such a merry-go-rounder as never happened before, I do rightly believe. Emily, my darling, come here, come here, <laughs> my little witch. There's Master Davy's friend, my dear. <laughs> There's the gentleman as you heard on, Emily. He comes to see you, along with Master Davy, on the brightest night of your uncle's life as ever was, or will be. Hurrah for it! Then he let her go, and as she ran into her little chamber, looked round upon us, quite hot, <laughs> and out of breath with his uncommon satisfaction, if you two gentlemen, gentlemen grow now, and such gentlemen, don't excuse me for being in a state of mind, when you understand matters, I'll ask your pardon. Emily, my dear, uh, she knows I'm going to tell, <laughs> and has made off. This here's little Emily, sir, to steer forth. Her, as you see, a blushing here just now, this here little Emily's of ours has been in our house, sir, what I believe, uh, <laughs> I'm an ignorant man, <laughs> but that's my belief. No one but a little bright-eyed creature can be in a house. She ain't my child, I, I never had one, but I couldn't love her more if she was fifty times my child. You understand, I couldn't do it. I quite understand. I, I know you do, sir, <laughs> and thank ye. Well, sir, there was a certain person, <laughs> a certain person as had knowed our Emily from the time when her father was drowned, as had seen her constant when a baby, when a young gal, when a woman, not much of a person to look at, huh? Something of my own build? <laughs> Rough? A good deal of a sou'wester in him? Wary salt? But on the whole, an honest sort of chap, too, with his art in the right place. I had never seen Ham grin to anything like the extent to which he sat grinning at us now. What is this here blessed tarplin go and do? But he loses that there art of his to our little Emily. He follows her about. He makes himself a sort of servant to her. He loses in a great measure his relish for his victuals, and in the long run, he makes it clear to me what's amiss. Well, I counsels him to speak to Emily. <laughs> he's big enough, but he's bashfuler than a little un. He says to me. He don't like. <laughs> so I speak. What, him? says Emily. Him? That I know so intimate so many a year and like so much? Oh, uncle, I never can have him. He's such a good fellow. I gives her a kiss and I says no more to her than, My dear, you're right to speak out. You're to choose for yourself. You're as free as a little bird. Then I aways to him, and I says, I wish it could have been so, but it can't. But you can both be as you was, and what I say to you is, be as you was with her. 
like a man hmm? <laughs> he says to me a shaking of my hand i will he says <laughs> and he was honourable true and manful going on for two year all of a sudden one evening as it might be to-night comes little emily from her work and him with her <laughs> well there ain't so much in that he'll say no sure because he takes care on her like a brother after dark and indeed afore dark and at all times <laughs> but this here tarplin chap he takes hold of her hand and he cries out to me joyful look ye here this is to be my little wife <laughs> and she says half bold and half shy and half a laughing and half a crying yes uncle if you please <laughs> if i please <laughs> lord as if i should do anything else <laughs> if you please she says i am steadier now and i have thought better of it and i'll be as good a little wife as i can to him for he's a dear good fellow <laughs> then mrs gummidge she claps her hands like a play and you come in <laughs> there the murder's out you come in <laughs> it took place this here present hour and here's the man as'll marry her the minute she's out of her time at the needlework ham staggered as well he might under the blow mr peggotty dealt him as a mark of confidence and friendship but feeling called upon to say something to us he stammered she warn't no higher than you was master davy when you first come here when i thought what she'd grow up to be i seen her grow up gentlemen like a flower i laid down my life for her master davy oh most content and cheerful there ain't a gentleman in all the land nor yet a sailing upon all the sea that can love his lady more than i love her though there's many a common man as could say better what he meant i thought it affecting to see such a sturdy fellow trembling in the strength of what he felt for the pretty little creature who had won his heart i thought of the simple confidence reposed in us by mr peggotty and by himself was touching i was affected by the story altogether i was filled with pleasure but at first with an indescribably sensitive pleasure that a very little would have changed to pain therefore if it had depended upon me to touch the prevailing chord among them with any skill i should have made a poor hand of it but it depended upon steerforth and he did it with such address that in a few minutes we were all as easy as possible mr peggotty he said you are a thoroughly good fellow and deserve to be as happy as you are to-night my hand upon it ham i give you joy my boy my hand upon that too davy stir the fire and make it a brisk one and mr peggotty unless you can induce your gentle niece to come back i shall go any gap at your fireside on such a night such a gap least of all i wouldn't make for the wealth of the indies so mr peggotty went to fetch little emily at first little emily didn't like to come and then ham went presently they brought her to the fireside very much confused and very shy but she soon became more assured when she found how steerforth spoke to her how skilfully he avoided anything that would embarrass her how he talked to mr peggotty of boats and ships and tides and fish how delighted he was with that boat and all belonging to it how lightly and easily he carried on until he brought us by degrees into a charmed circle but he set up no monopoly of the conversation he was silent and attentive when little emily talked across the fire to me of our old childish wanderings upon the beach to pick up shells and pebbles 
he was very silent and attentive when i asked her if she recollected how i used to love her and how we used to walk about that dim old flat hours and hours and how the days sported by us as if time himself had not grown up then but were a child like ourselves and always at play she sat all the evening in her old little corner by the fire ham beside her i could not satisfy myself whether it was in her little tormenting way or in a maidenly reserve before us that she kept quite close to the wall and away from ham but i observed that she did so all the evening as i remember it was almost midnight when we took our leave we had some biscuit and dried fish for supper and steerforth had produced from his pocket a flask of hollands <laughs> we parted merrily and as they all stood crowded round the door to light us on our road i saw the sweet blue eyes of little emily peeping after us from behind ham and heard her soft voice calling to us to be careful how we went a most engaging little beauty said steerforth taking my arm well it's a quaint place and they are quaint company and it's quite a new sensation to mix with them how fortunate we are too steerforth to have arrived to witness their happiness in that intended marriage i never saw people so happy how delightful to see it yes that's rather a chuckle-headed fellow for the girl isn't he i felt a shock in this cold reply but turning quickly upon him and seeing a laugh in his eyes i answered ah steerforth it's well for you to joke about the poor but when i see how perfectly you understand them and how you can enter into happiness like this plain fisherman's i know there is not a joy or sorrow or any emotion of such people that can be indifferent to you and i admire and love you for it steerforth twenty times the more to my surprise he suddenly said with nothing that i could see to lead to it daisy i wish to god i had had a judicious father these last twenty years you know my mother has always doted on me and spoilt me i wish with all my soul i had been better guided i wish with all my soul i could guide myself better there was a passionate dejection in his manner that quite amazed me he was more unlike himself than i could have supposed possible it would be better to be this poor peggotty or his lout of a nephew than be myself twenty times richer and twenty times wiser and be the torment to myself that i have been in that devil's bark of a boat within the last half hour i was so confounded by the change in him that at first i could only regard him in silence as he walked by my side at length i asked him to tell me what had happened to cross him so unusually <laughs> it's nothing nothing davy i must have had a nightmare i think what old women call the horrors have been creeping over me from head to foot <laughs> i have been afraid of myself you are afraid of nothing else i think perhaps not and yet may have enough to be afraid of too well so it goes by daisy <laughs> for though that's not the name your godfathers and godmothers gave you you're such a fresh fellow that it's the name i best like to call you by and i wish i wish i wish you could give it to me why so i can if i choose daisy 
if anything should ever happen to separate us you must think of me at my best old boy come let us make that bargain think of me at my best if circumstances should ever part us you have no best to me steerforth and no worst you are always equally loved and cherished in my heart i was up to go away alone next morning with the dawn and having dressed as quietly as i could looked into his room he was fast asleep lying easily with his head upon his arm as i had often seen him lie at school the time came in its season and that was very soon when i almost wondered that nothing troubled his repose as i looked at him then but he slept let me think of him so again as i had often seen him sleep at school and thus in this silent hour i left him never more o oh god forgive you steerforth to touch that passive hand in love and friendship never never more end of chapter one chapter two of david copperfield condensed by the author for his dramatic readings in america by charles dickens this recording is in the public domain your reader michael armenta chapter two some months elapsed before i again found myself down in that part of the country and approaching the old boat by night it was a dark evening and rain was beginning to fall when i came within sight of mr peggotty's house and of the light within it shining through the window a little floundering across the sand which was heavy brought me to the door and i went in i was bidden to a little supper emily was to be married to ham that day fortnight and this was the last time i was to see her in her maiden life it looked very comfortable indeed mr peggotty had smoked his evening pipe and there were preparations for supper by and by the fire was bright the ashes were thrown up the locker was ready for little emily in her old place mrs gummidge appeared to be fretting a little in her own corner and consequently looked quite natural you're the first of a lot master davy sit ye down sir it ain't of no use saying welcome to you but you're welcome kind and hearty here mrs gummidge groaned cheer up cheer up mrs gummidge said mr peggotty no no dan it'll make of no use telling me to cheer up when everything goes contrary with me nothing's natural to me but to be lone and lorn after looking at mrs gummidge for some moments with great sympathy mr peggotty glanced at the dutch clock rose snuffed the candle and put it in the window there there we are mrs gummidge mrs gummidge slightly groaned again there we are mrs gummidge lighted up according to custom you're her wondering what's that for sir well it's for our little emily you see the path ain't over light or cheerful out of dark and when i'm here at the hour as she's coming home from her needlework downtown i puts the light in the winder well, you see meets two objects she says to herself says emily there's home she says and likewise says emily my uncle's there <laughs> for if i ain't there i never have no light showed <laughs> you may say this is like a baby sir well i don't know but but what i am a baby in regard of emily not to look at but to consider you know <laughs> i don't care <laughs> bless you 
now i tell you when i go a-looking and looking about that dear pretty house of our emily's all got ready for her to be married if it don't feel as if the littlest things was her most i takes em up and i puts em down and i touches of em as delicate as if they was our emily so tis with her little bonnets and that i couldn't see one on em rough used a purpose not for the whole world it's my opinion you see as this is along of my having played with emily so much when she was a child and having made believe as we were turks and french and sharks <laughs> and every variety of foreigners bless you yes <laughs> and lions and whales and i don't know what all when she weren't no higher than my knee i've got into the way on it you know why this here candle now i know very well that art she's married and gone i shall put that candle there just the same as now and sit afore the fire pretending i'm expecting of her <laughs> like as i'm a-doing now <laughs> why at the present minute when i see the candle sparkle up i says to myself she's looking at it <laughs> emily's coming <gasps> right too for here she is no it was only ham the night should have turned more wet since i came in for he had a large sou'wester hat on slouched over his face where's emily ham made a movement as if she were outside mr peggotty took the light from the window trimmed it put it on the table and was stirring the fire when ham who had not moved said Master Davy, will you come out a minute and see what Emily and me has got to show you? As I passed him, I saw to my astonishment and fright that he was deadly pale. He closed the door upon us, only upon us two. Ham, what's the matter? My love, Master Davy, the pride and hope of my art her that i'd have died for and would die for now she's gone gone emily's run away you're a scholar and know what's right and best but what am i to say indoors how am i ever to break it to him master davy i saw the door move and trying to hold the latch to gain a moment's time it was too late Mr. Peggotty thrust forth his face, and never could I forget the change that came upon it when he saw us, if I were to live five hundred years. I remember a great wail and cry, and the women hanging about him, and we all standing in the room, I with an open letter in my hand which Ham had given me. Mr. Peggotty, with his vest torn, his hair wild, his face and lips white, and blood trickling down his bosom. It had sprung from his mouth, I think. Slow, please. I don't know as I can understand. In the midst of the silence of death, I read thus, from the blotted letter Ham had given me. In Emily's hand, addressed to himself when you who love me so much better than i have deserved even when my mind was innocent see this i shall be far away when i leave my dear home my dear home oh my dear home in the morning the letter bore date on the previous night it will be never to come back unless he brings me back a lady a lady this will be found at night many hours after instead of me for mercy's sake tell uncle that i never loved him half so dear as now oh don't remember you and i were ever to be married but try to think as if i died when i was very little and was buried somewhere pray heaven that i am going away from have compassion on my uncle 
be his comfort love some good girl that will be what i was once to uncle and that will be true to you and worthy of you and know no shame but me god bless all if he don't bring me back a lady and i don't pray for my own self i'll pray for all my parting love to uncle my last tears and my last thanks for uncle that was all he stood long after i had ceased to read still looking at me slowly at last he moved his eyes from my face and cast them round the room who's the man i want to know his name ham glanced at me and suddenly i felt a shock master davy go out a bit and let me tell him what i must you don't ought to hear it sir i sank down in a chair and tried to utter some reply but my tongue was fettered and my sight was weak for i felt that the man was my friend the friend i had unhappily introduced there steerforth my old schoolfellow and my friend i want to know his name master davy it ain't no fault of yourn and i'm far from laying of it to you but it is your friend steerforth and he's a damned villain mr peggotty moved no more until he seemed to wake all at once and pulled down his rough coat from its peg in a corner bear a hand with this i'm struck of a heap and can't do it bear a hand and help me well now give me that there hat ham asked him whither he was going i'm a-going to seek my niece i'm going to seek my emily i'm a-going first to stave in that there boat as he gave me and sink it where i would have drowned it him as i'm a living soul if i had had one thought of what was in him as he sat afore me in that boat face to face strike me down dead but i have drowned it him and thought it right i'm going fur to seek my niece where anywhere i'm a-going to seek my niece through the world i'm a-going to find my poor niece in her shame and bring her back with my comfort and forgiveness no one stop me i tell you i'm a-going to seek my niece I'm a going to seek her far and wide. Mrs. Gummidge came between them in a fit of crying. No, no, Dan'l, not as you are now. Seek her in a little while, my lone, lorn Dan'l, and that'll be but right, but not as you are now. Sit ye down and give me your forgiveness for ever having been a word to you, Dan'l. What have my contraries ever been to this? and let us speak a word about them times when she was first an orphan and when ham was too and when i was a poor widow woman and you took me in it'll soften your poor heart Daniel, and you'll bear your sorrow better for you know the promise Daniel, as you have done it unto one of the least of these you have done it unto me and that can never fail under this roof that's been our shelter for so many many years he was quite passive now and when i heard him crying the impulse that had been upon me to go down upon my knees and curse steerforth yielded to a better feeling my overcharged heart found the same relief as his and i cried too end of chapter two
Chapter Three of David Copperfield, as condensed by the author for his dramatic readings in America, by Charles Dickens. This recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Chapter Three. At this period of my life, I lived in my top set of chambers in Buckingham Street, Strand, London, and was over head and heels in love with Dora. I lived principally on Dora and coffee. My appetite languished, and I was glad of it, for I felt as though it would have been an act of perfidy towards Dora to have a natural relish for my dinner. I bought four sumptuous waistcoats. Not for myself, I had no pride in them. For Dora. I took to wearing straw-colored kid gloves in the streets. I laid the foundations of all the corns I have ever had. If the boots I wore at that period could only be produced, and compared with the natural size of my feet, they would show in a most affecting manner what the state of my heart was. Mrs. Crupp, the housekeeper of my chambers, must have been a woman of penetration, for when this attachment was but a few weeks old, she found it out. She came up to me one evening, when I was very low, to ask, she being afflicted with spasms, if I could oblige her with a little tincture of cardamoms mixed with rhubarb, and flavoured with seven drops of the essence of cloves or, if I had not such a thing by me, with a little brandy, as I had never ever heard of the first remedy, and always had the second in the closet, I gave Mrs. Crupp a glass of the second, which, that I might have no suspicion of its being devoted to any improper use, she began to take up immediately. Cheer up, sir! said Mrs. Crupp. Excuse me. I know what it is, sir. There's a lady in the case. Mrs. Crupp? Oh, bless you. Keep a good art, sir. Never say die, sir. If she don't smile upon you, there's a many as will. You're a young gentleman to be smiled on, Mr. Copperful. "'And you must learn your value, sir.' "'Mrs. Crupp always called me Mr. Copperful, "'firstly, no doubt, because it was not my name, "'and, secondly, I am inclined to think "'in some indistinct association with a washing day. "'What makes you suppose there is any young lady in the case, Mrs. Crupp?' "'Oh, Mr. Copperful!' I'm a mother myself. Your boots and your waist is equally too small. And you don't eat enough, sir, nor yet drink. Sir, I've laundressed other young gentlemen besides you. It was but the gentleman which died here before yourself that fell in love with a barmaid, and had his waistcoats took in directly, though much swelled by drinking. Mrs. Crop. I must beg you not to connect the young lady, in my case, with the barmaid, or anything of that sort, if you please. Mr. Copperful, I'm a mother myself, not likely. I ask your pardon, sir, if I intrude. I should never wish to intrude where I were not welcome. But you are a young gentleman, Mr. Copperful. And my advice to you is to cheer up, sir, to keep a good heart, and to know your own value. If you was to take to something, sir, if you were to take to skittles now, which is healthy, you might find it divert your mind and do you good. I turned it off and changed the subject by informing Mrs. Grupp that I wished to entertain at dinner next day my esteemed friend Traddles, and Mr. and Mrs. Micawber, and I took the liberty of suggesting a pair of soles, a small leg of mutton, 
and a pigeon pie. Mrs. Crupp broke out into rebellion on my first bashful hint in reference to her cooking the fish and joint, but in the end a compromise was effected, and Mrs. Crupp consented to achieve this feat on condition that I dine from home for a fortnight afterwards. Having laid in the materials for a bowl of punch to be compounded by Mr. Micawber, having provided a bottle of lavender water, two wax candles, a paper of mixed pins, and a pincushion, to assist Mrs. Micawber in her toilet, at my dressing-table, having also caused the fire in my bedroom to be lighted for Mrs. Micawber's convenience, and having laid the cloth with my own hands, I awaited the result with composure. At the appointed time, my three visitors arrived together, Mr. Micawber, with more shirt-collar than usual, and a new ribbon to his eyeglass, Mrs. Micawber, with her cap in a parcel, Traddles carrying the parcel, and supporting Mrs. Micawber on his arm. They were all delighted with my residence. When I conducted Mrs. Micawber to my dressing-table, and she saw the scale on which it was prepared for her, she was in such raptures that she called Mr. Micawber to come in and look. "'My dear Mr. Copperfield,' said Mr. Micawber, "'this is luxurious. This is a way of life which reminds me of the period when I was myself in a state of celibacy.' <sighs> I am at present established on what may be designated as a small and unassuming scale. But you are aware that I have, in the course of my career, surmounted difficulties and conquered obstacles. You are no stranger to the fact that there have been periods of my life when it has been requisite that I should pause until certain expected events should turn up when it has been necessary that I should fall back before making what I trust, I shall not be accused of presumption in terming a spring. The present is one of those momentous stages in the life of man. <laughs> you find me fallen back for a spring, <laughs> and I have every reason to believe that a vigorous sleep will shortly be the result. I informed Mr. Micawber that I relied upon him, for a bowl of punch, and led him to the lemons. I never saw a man so thoroughly enjoy himself as he stirred and mixed and tasted, and looked as if he were making not mere punch, but a fortune for his family, down to the latest posterity. As to Mrs. Micawber, I don't know whether it was the effect of the cap, or the lavender water, or the pins, or the fire, or the wax candles, but she came out of my room, comparatively speaking, l lovely. I suppose, I never ventured to inquire, but I suppose, that Mrs. Crupp, after frying the soles, was taken ill, <laughs> because we broke down at that point. The leg of mutton came up very red inside, and very pale outside, besides having a foreign substance of a gritty nature sprinkled over it, as if it had had a fall into ashes. But we were not in a condition to judge of this fact from the appearance of the gravy, for as much as it had been all dropped on the stairs. The pigeon pie was not bad, but it was a delusive pie, the crust being like a disappointing phrenological head, full of lumps and bumps with nothing particular underneath in short the banquet was such a failure that i should have been quite unhappy about the failure i mean for i was always unhappy about dora if i had not been relieved by the great good humour of my company my dear copperfield said mr micawber Accidents will happen in the best regulated families, and especially in families not regulated by that pervading influence which sanctifies while it enhances the 
Oh, uh, I would say, in short, by the influence of woman in the lofty character of wife. If you will allow me to take the liberty of remarking that there are a few comestibles better in their way than a devil, and that I believe with a little division of labor we could accomplish a good one, if the person in attendance could produce a gridiron, I would put it to you that this little misfortune may be easily repaired. There was a gridiron in the pantry on which my morning rasher of bacon was cooked. We had set it out in a twinkling. Traddles cut the mutton into slices. Mr. Micawber covered them with pepper, mustard, salt, and cayenne. I put them on the gridiron, turned them with a fork, and took them off under Mr. Micawber's direction. And Mrs. Micawber heated some mushroom ketchup in a little saucepan. Under these circumstances, my appetite came back miraculously, for I am ashamed to confess it, but I really believe I forgot Dora for a little while. Punch, my dear Copperfield, tasting it as soon as dinner was done. Like time and tide, waits for no man. Hmm. Ah. It is at the present moment in high flavor. My love, will you give me your opinion? Mrs. Micawber pronounced it excellent. As we are quite confidential here, Mr. Copperfield, said Mrs. Micawber, sipping her punch, Mr. Traddles being a part of our domesticity, I should much like to have your opinion on Mr. Micawber's prospects. I have insulted branches of my family on the course most expedient for Mr. Micawber to take, and it was that he should immediately turn his attention to coals. To what, ma'am? To coals. To the coal trade. Mr. Micawber was induced to think, on inquiry, that there might be an opening for a man of his talent in the Medway coal trade. Then, as Mr. Micawber very properly said, the first step to be taken clearly was to go and see the Medway, which we went and saw. I say we, Mr. Copperfield, for I never will desert Mr. Micawber. I am a wife and mother, and I never will desert Mr. Micawber. Traddles and I murmured our admiration. That, at least, is my view, my dear Mr. Copperfield, and Mr. Traddles, of the obligation which I took upon myself, and I repeated the irrevocable words, I, Emma, take thee, Wilkins. I read the service over with a flat candle on the previous night, and the conclusion I derived from it was that I never could or would desert Mr. Micawber. "'My dear,' said Mr. Micawber, a little impatiently, "'I am not conscious that you are expected to do anything of the sort.' "'We went,' repeated Mrs. Micawber, "'and saw the Medway.' My opinion of the coal trade on that river was that it might require talent, but that it certainly requires capital. Talent, Mr. Micawber has. Capital, Mr. Micawber has. <clears throat> Not. We saw, I think, the greater part of the Medway, and that was my individual conclusion. <sighs> My family were then of opinion that Mr. Micawber should turn his attention to corn. <clears throat> on commission, but corn, as I have repeatedly said to Mr. Micawber, may be gentlemanly, but it is not remunerative, commission to the extent of two and nine pence in a fortnight cannot, however limited our ideas, be considered remunerative. We were all agreed upon that. Then, said Mrs. Micawber, who prided herself on taking a clear view of things, and keeping Mr. Micawber straight by her woman's wisdom, when he might otherwise go a little crooked. 
that i naturally look round the world and say what is there in which a person of mr micawber's talent is likely to succeed i may have a conviction that mr micawber's manners peculiarly qualify him for the banking business i may argue within myself that if i had a deposit in a banking house the manners of mr micawber as representing that banking house would inspire confidence and extend the connection but if the various banking houses refuse to avail themselves of mr micawber's abilities or receive the offer of them with contumely what is the use of dwelling upon that idea none as to originating a banking business i may know that there are members of my family who if they chose to put their money in mr micawber's hands might found an establishment of that description but if they do not choose to place their money in mr micawber's hands <coughs> which they don't what is the use of that again i contend that we are no further advanced than we were before i shook my head and said not a bit <coughs> not a bit traddles also shook his head and said not a bit what do i deduce from this mrs micawber went on to say still with the same air of putting a case lucidly what is the conclusion my dear mr copperfield to which i am irresistibly brought am i wrong in saying it is clear that we must live i answered not at all and traddles answered not at all and i found myself afterwards sagely adding alone that a person must either live or die just so returned mrs micawber it is precisely that and here is mr micawber without any suitable position or employment where does that responsibility rest clearly on society then i would make a fact so disgraceful known and boldly challenge society to set it right it appears to me my dear mr copperfield that what mr micawber has to do is to throw down the gauntlet to society and say in effect <clears throat> show me who will take that up let the party immediately step forward i ventured to ask mrs micawber how this was to be done by advertising in all the papers it appears to me that what mr micawber has to do in justice to himself in justice to his family and i will even go so far as to say in justice to society by which he has been hitherto <clears throat> overlooked is to advertise in all the papers to describe himself plainly as so and so with such and such qualifications and to put it thus <clears throat> now employ me on remunerative terms and address post paid to w m post office camden town advertising is rather expensive i remarked exactly so said mrs micawber preserving the same logical air quite true my dear mr copperfield i have made the identical observation to mr micawber it is for that reason especially that i think mr micawber ought to raise a certain sum of money on a <clears throat> bill mr micawber leaning back in his chair trifled with his eyeglass and cast his eye up at the ceiling but i thought him observant of traddles too who was looking at the fire if no member of my family said mrs micawber is possessed of a sufficient natural feeling to negotiate that bill uh, i believe there is a better business term to express what i mean mr micawber with his eyes still cast up at the ceiling suggested discount to discount that bill then my opinion is that mr micawber should go into the city should take that bill into the money market and should dispose of it for what he can get i felt but i am sure i don't know why that this was highly self-denying and devoted in mrs micawber 
and I uttered a murmur to that effect. Traddles, who took his tone from me, did likewise, and really I felt that she was a noble woman, the sort of a woman who might have been a Roman matron, and done all manner of troublesome, heroic, public actions. In the fervour of this impression, I congratulated Mr. Micawber on the treasure he possessed. So did Traddles. Mr. Micawber extended his hand to each of us in succession, and then covered his face with his pocket-handkerchief, which I think had more snuff upon it than he was aware of, he then returned to the punch in the highest state of exhilaration. Mrs. Micawber made tea for us in a most agreeable manner, and after tea we discussed a variety of topics before the fire, and she was good enough to sing us in a small, thin, flat voice, which I remembered to have considered, when I first knew her, the very table beer of acoustics the favourite ballads of the dashing white sergeant and little tafflin for both of these songs mrs micawber had been famous when she lived at home with her papa and mamma mr micawber told us that when he heard her sing the first one on the occasion of his seeing her beneath the parental roof she had attracted his attention in an extraordinary degree, but that when it came to little Taflin, he had resolved to win that woman, or perish in the attempt. It was between ten and eleven o'clock when Mrs. Micawber rose to replace her cap in the parcel, and to put on her bonnet. Mr. Micawber took the opportunity to slip a letter into my hand with a whispered request that I would read it at my leisure. I also took the opportunity of my holding a candle over the banisters to light them down, when Mr. Micawber was going first, leading Mrs. Micawber, to detain Traddles for a moment at the top of the stairs. Traddles, Mr. Micawber don't mean any harm, but if I were you, I wouldn't lend him anything. My dear Copperfield, I haven't got anything to lend. You have got a name, you know. Oh, you call that something to lend? Certainly. Oh, yes, to be sure. Oh, I am very much obliged to you, Copperfield, but I am afraid I have lent him that already. Uh, for the bill that is to go into the money market? No, not for that one. This is the first I have heard of that one. I have been thinking that he will most likely propose that one on the way home. Mine's another. I hope there will be nothing wrong with it. I hope not. I should think not, though, because he told me only the other day that it was provided for. That was Mr. Micawber's expression, provided for. Mr. Micawber looked up at this juncture. I had only time to repeat my caution. Traddles thanked me, and descended. But I was much afraid when I observed the good-natured manner in which he went down with Mrs. Micawber's cap in his hand, that he would be carried off into the money market neck and heels. I returned to my fireside and read Mr. Micawber's letter, which was dated an hour and a half before dinner. I am not sure whether I have mentioned that, when Mr. Micawber was at any particular desperate crisis, he used a sort of legal phraseology which he seemed to think equivalent to winding up his affairs. This was the letter. Sir, for I dare not say, my dear Copperfield, it is expedient that I should inform you that the undersigned is crushed. 
some flickering efforts to spare the premature knowledge of his calamitous position you may observe in him this day <laughs> but hope has sunk beneath the horizon and the undersigned is crushed the present communication is penned within the personal range i cannot call it the society of an individual in a state closely bordering on intoxication employed by a broker that individual is in legal possession of the premises under a distress for rent <laughs> his inventory includes not only the chattels and effects of every description belonging to the undersigned as yearly tenant of this habitation but also those appertaining to mr thomas traddles lodger a member of the honourable society of the inner temple <laughs> if any drop of gloom were wanting in the overflowing cup which is now commanded in the language of an immortal writer to the lips of the undersigned it would be found in the fact that a friendly acceptance granted to the undersigned by the before-mentioned mr thomas traddles for the sum of twenty-three pounds four shillings nine and a half sixpence is overdue and is not provided for <laughs> also in the fact that the living responsibilities clinging to the undersigned will in the course of nature be increased by the sum of one more helpless victim whose miserable appearance may be looked for in round numbers at the expiration of a period not exceeding six lunar months from the present date <laughs> after premising thus much it would be a work of supererogation to add that dust and ashes are for ever scattered on the head of wilkins micawber Ooh. end of chapter three chapter four of david copperfield as condensed by the author for his dramatic readings in america by charles dickens this recording is in the public domain your reader michael armenta chapter four seldom did i wake at night seldom did i look up at the moon or stars or watch the falling rain or hear the wind but i thought of the solitary figure of the good fisherman toiling on poor pilgrim and recalled his words i'm a-going to seek my niece i'm going to seek her far and wide months passed and he had been absent no one knew where the whole time it had been a bitter day in london and a cutting north-east wind had blown the wind had gone down with the light and snow had come on my shortest way home and i naturally took the shortest way home on such a night was through st martin's lane on the steps of the church there was a figure of a man and i stood face to face with mr peggotty Master Davy, it do my art good to see you, sir. Well met, well met. Well met, my dear old friend. I had thought of coming to make inquiration for you, sir, to-night, but it was too late. I should have come early in the morning, sir, afore going away again. Again? Yes, sir, I'm away to-morrow in those days there was a side entrance to the stable-yard of the golden cross inn two or three public rooms opened out of the yard and looking into one of them and finding it empty and a good fire burning i took him in there i'll tell you master davy where all i've been and what all have we've heard i've been far we've heard little but i'll tell you as he sat thinking 
there was a fine massive gravity in his face which i did not venture to disturb you see sir when she was a child she used to talk to me a deal about the sea and about them coasts where the sea got to be dark blue and to lay a shining and a shining in the sun when she was lost i knowed in my mind as he would take her to them countries i knowed in my mind as he have told her wonders of em and how she was to be a lady there and how he first got her to listen him along a such like i went across the channel to france and landed there as if i fell down from the skies i found out an english gentleman as was in authority and told him i was going to seek my niece he got me them papers as i wanted for to carry me through <laughs> i don't rightly know what they're called and he would have give me money but that i was thankful to have no need on i thanked him kind for all he had done i'm sure i told him best as i was able what my gratitude was and went away through france for to seek my niece alone and on foot mostly afoot sometimes in carts along with people going to market sometimes in empty coaches many mile a day afoot and often with some poor soldier or another travelling for to see his friends well, i couldn't talk to him nor he to me but we was company to one another too along the dusty roads when i come to any town i found the inn and waited about the yard till some one came by some one mostly did as knowed english and then i told how that i was on my way to seek my niece and they told me what manner of gentlefolks was in the house and i waited to see any seemed like her going in and out when it weren't emily i went on again by little and little when i come to a new village or that among the poor people i found they knowed about me they would set me down at their cottage doors and give me what not for to eat and drink and show me where to sleep and many a woman master davy as has had a daughter about emily's age i found waiting for me at our saviour's cross outside the village for to do me similar kindness some as had daughters as was dead but god only knows how good them mothers were to me i laid my trembling hand upon the hand he put before his face <laughs> thank ye sir don't take no notice at last i come to the sea it warn't hard you may suppose for a seafaring man like me to work his way over to italy when i got there i wandered on as i had afore i got news of her being seen among them swiss mountains yonder i made for them mountains day and night ever so fur as i went ever so fur the mountains seemed to shift away from me but i come up with them and i crossed em i never doubted her no not a bit only let my standing still afore her bring to her thoughts the home she had fled away from and the child she had been and if she had grow to be a royal lady she'd have fell down at my feet i knowed it well i bought a country dress to put upon her to put that dress upon her and to cast off what she wore to take her on my arm again and wander towards home to stop sometimes on the road and heal her bruised feet and her worse bruised heart was all i thought of now but master davy it warn't to be not yet it was too late and they was gone where i couldn't learn some said here some said there i travelled here and i travelled there but i found no emily and i travelled home how long ago a matter of four days i sighted the old boat out of dark and i never could have thought i'm sure that 
the old boat would have been so strange. From some pocket in his breast he took out, with a very careful hand, a small paper bundle containing two or three letters, or little packets, which he laid upon the table. The faithful creature, Mrs. Gummidge, gave me these. This first one came afore I had been gone a week. A fifty-pound bank-note, in a sheet of paper, directed to me, and put underneath the door in the night. She tried to hide her writing, but she couldn't hide it from me. This one come to Mrs. Gummidge two or three months ago. Five pounds! It was untouched like the previous sum, and he refolded both. Is that another letter in your hand? It's money, too, sir. Ten pound, you see. And wrote inside, from a true friend. But the two first was put underneath the door, and this come by the post, day afore yesterday. I'm going to seek her at the postmark. He showed it to me. It was a town on the Upper Rhine. He had found out at Yarmouth some foreign dealers who knew that country, and they had drawn him a rude map on paper, which he could very well understand. I asked him how Ham was. He works as bold as a man can. He's never been heard for to complain, but my belief is twixt ourselves as it has cut him deep well having seen you to-night master davy and that does me good i shall away betimes to-morrow morning you've seen what i got here putting his hand on where the little packet lay all that troubles me is to think that any harm might come to me afore this money was get back if i was to die and it was lost or stole or elseways made away with and it was never knowed by him but what i'd accepted of it i believe the t'other world wouldn't hold me i believe i must come back he rose and i rose too we grasped each other by the hand again and as we went out into the rigorous night Everything seemed to be hushed in reverence for him when he resumed his solitary journey through the snow. End of chapter 4「Five of David Copperfield, as condensed by the author for his dramatic readings in America. By Charles Dickens. This recording is in the public domain. Your reader, Michael Armenta. Chapter Five. All this time I had gone on loving Dora harder than ever. If I may so express it, I was steeped in Dora. I was not merely over head and heels in love with her, I was saturated through and through. I took night walks to Norwood, where she lived, and perambulated round and round the house and garden for hours together, looking through crevices in the palings, using violent exertions to get my chin above the rusty nails on the top, blowing kisses at the lights in the windows, and romantically calling on the night to shield my Dora. I don't exactly know from what. I suppose from fire? perhaps from mice, to which she had a great objection. Dora had a discreet friend, comparatively stricken in years, almost of the ripe age of twenty, I should say, whose name was Miss Mills. Dora called her Julia. She was the bosom friend of Dora. Happy Miss Mills! One day Miss Mills said, Dora is coming to stay with me. She is coming the day after tomorrow. If you would like to call, I am sure Papa would be happy to see you. I passed three days in a luxury of wretchedness. 
at last arrayed for the purpose at a vast expense i went to miss mills fraught with a declaration mr mills was not at home i didn't expect he would be <laughs> nobody wanted him miss mills was at home mm, miss mills would do i was shown into a room upstairs where miss mills and dora were dora's little dog jip was there miss mills was copying music and dora was painting flowers what were my feelings when i recognized flowers i had given her miss mills was very glad to see me and very sorry her papa was not at home though i thought we all bore that with fortitude miss mills was conversational for a few minutes and then laying down her pen got up and left the room i began to think that i would put it off till to-morrow i hope your poor horse was not tired when he got home at night from that picnic said dora lifting up her beautiful eyes it was a long way for him hmm, i began to think i would do it to-day it was a long way for him for he had nothing to uphold him on the journey wasn't he fed poor thing i began to think i would put it off till to-morrow yes he was well taken care of i mean he had not the unutterable happiness that i had in being so near to you i saw now that i was in for it and it must be done on the spot i don't know why you should care for being near me said dora or why you should call it happiness but of course you don't mean what you say jip you naughty boy come here i had dora in my arms i was full of eloquence i never stopped for a word i told her how i loved her i told her i should die without her i told her that i idolized and worshipped her jip barked madly all the time my eloquence increased and i said if she would like me to die for her she had but to say the word and i was ready i had loved her to distraction every minute day and night since i first set eyes upon her i loved her at that minute to distraction i should always love her every minute to distraction lovers had loved before and lovers would love again but no lover had ever loved might could would or should ever love as i loved dora the more i raved the more jip barked each of us in his own way got more mad at every moment well well dora and i were sitting on the sofa by and by quiet enough and jip was lying in her lap winking peacefully at me it was off my mind i was in a state of perfect rapture dora and i were engaged being poor i felt it necessary the next time i went to my darling to expatiate on that unfortunate drawback i soon carried desolation into the bosom of our joys not that i meant to do it but that i was so full of the subject by asking dora without the smallest preparation if she could love a beggar how can you ask me anything so foolish <laughs> love a beggar dora my own dearest i am a beggar how can you be such a silly thing replied dora slapping my hand as to sit there telling such stories i'll make you bite you if you are so ridiculous but i looked so serious that dora began to cry she did nothing but exclaim oh dear oh dear and oh she was so frightened and where was julia mills and oh take her to julia mills and please go away please 
until I was almost beside myself. I thought I had killed her. I sprinkled water on her face. I went down on my knees. I plucked at my hair. I implored her forgiveness. I besought her to look up and ravaged Miss Mill's workbox for a smelling bottle, and in my agony of mind applied an ivory needle case instead and dropped all the needles over Dora. <laughs> at last I got Dora to look at me with a horrified expression, which I gradually soothed until it was only loving and her soft pretty cheek was lying against mine is your heart mine still dear dora oh yes oh yes it's all yours oh don't be dreadful my dearest love the crust well earned oh yes 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 but i don't want to hear any more about crusts and after we are married chip must have a mutton chop every day at twelve or he'll die I was charmed with her childish, winning way, and I fondly explained to her that Jip should have his mutton chop with his accustomed regularity. When we had been engaged some half-year or so, Dora delighted me by asking me to give her that cookery book I had once spoken of, and to show her how to keep accounts, as I had once promised I would. I brought the volume with me on my next visit. I got it prettily bound, first to make it look less dry and more inviting, and showed her an old housekeeping book of my aunt's, and gave her a set of tablets and a pretty pencil case, and a box of leads, to practice housekeeping with. The cookery book made Dora's head ache, and the figures made her cry. They wouldn't add up, she said. So she rubbed them all out, and drew little nosegays and likenesses of me, and Jip, all over the tablets. Time went on. At last, here in this hand of mine, I held the wedding license. There were two names in the sweet old visionary connection, David Copperfield and Dora Spenlow. And there in the corner was that parental institution, the stamp office, looking down upon our union, and there, in the printed form of words, was the Archbishop of Canterbury invoking a blessing on us, and doing it as cheap as could possibly be expected. I doubt whether two young birds could have known less about keeping house than I and my pretty Dora did. We had a servant, of course. She kept house for us. We had an awful time of it with Mary Ann. Her name was Paragon. Her nature was represented to us when we engaged her as being feebly expressed in her name. She had a written character as large as a proclamation, and according to this document, could do everything of a domestic nature that I ever heard of, and a great many things that I never did hear of. She was a woman in the prime of life, of a severe countenance, and subject, particularly in the arms, to a sort of perpetual measles. She had a cousin in the lifeguards with such long legs that he looked like the afternoon shadow of somebody else. She was warranted, sober, and honest, and I am therefore willing to believe that she was in a fit when we found her under the boiler and that the <clears throat> deficient teaspoons were attributable to the dustman. She was the case of our first little quarrel. "'My dearest wife,' I said one day to Dora, "'do you think Marianne has any idea of time?' "'Why, Dodie?' "'My love, because it's five, and we were to have dined at four. My little wife came and sat upon my knee to coax me to be quiet, and drew a line with her pencil down the middle of my nose, but I couldn't dine off that, though it was very agreeable. 
don't you think my dear it would be better for you to remonstrate with mary ann oh no please i couldn't doady why not my love oh because i'm such a little goose and she knows i am i thought this sentiment so incompatible with the establishment of any system of check on marianne that i frowned a little my precious wife we must be serious sometimes come sit down on this chair close beside me now give me the pencil there now let us talk sensibly you know dear what a little hand it was to hold and what a tiny wedding ring it was to see you know my love it is not exactly comfortable to have to go out without one's dinner now is it mm, no replied dora faintly my love how you tremble because i know you're going to scold me my sweet i'm only going to reason oh but reasoning is worse than scolding i didn't marry to be reasoned with if you meant to reason with such a poor little thing as i am you ought have told me so you cruel boy dora my darling no i am not your darling because you must be sorry that you married me or else you wouldn't reason with me i felt so injured by the inconsequential nature of this charge that it gave me courage to be brave now my own dora you are childish and are talking nonsense you must remember i'm sure that i was obliged to go out yesterday when dinner was half over and that the day before i was made quite unwell by being obliged to eat underdone veal in a hurry to-day i don't dine at all and then i'm afraid to say how long we waited for breakfast and then the water didn't boil i don't mean to reproach you my dear but this is not comfortable <gasps> oh you cruel cruel boy to say i am a disagreeable wife now my dear dora you must know that i never said that you said i wasn't comfortable i said the housekeeping was not comfortable it's exactly the same thing and i wonder i do at your making such ungrateful speeches when you know that the other day when you said you would like a little bit of fish i went out myself miles and miles and ordered it to surprise you and it was very kind of you my own darling and i felt it so much that i wouldn't on any account have mentioned that you bought a salmon which was too much for two <clears throat> or that it cost one pound six <laughs> which was more than we can afford you enjoyed it very much and you said i was a mouse and i'll say so again my love a thousand times i said it a thousand times and more and went on saying it until marianne's cousin deserted into our coal hole and was brought out to our great amazement by a picket of his companions in arms who took him away handcuffed in a procession that covered our front garden with disgrace everybody we had anything to do with seemed to cheat us our appearance in a shop was a signal for the damaged goods to be brought out immediately if we bought a lobster it was full of water all our meat turned out tough and there was hardly any crust to our loaves as to the washerwoman pawning the clothes and coming in a state of penitent intoxication to apologize <laughs> i suppose that might have happened several times to anybody also the chimney on fire the parish engine and perjury on the part of the beadle but i apprehended we were personally unfortunate in our page whose principal function was to quarrel with the cook we wanted to get rid of him but he was very much attached to us and wouldn't go until one day he stole dora's watch and spent the produce he was always a weak-minded boy in riding up and down between london and oxbridge 
outside the coach he was taken to the police office on the completion of his fifteenth journey when four and sixpence and a second-hand fife which he couldn't play were found upon his person he was tried and ordered to be transported even then he couldn't be quiet and was always writing us letters and he wanted so much to see dora before he went away that dora went to visit him and fainted when she found herself inside the iron bars i had no peace of my life until he was expatriated and made as i afterwards heard a shepherd of uh, up the country somewhere i have no geographical idea where i'm very sorry for all this doady said dora will you call me a name i want you to call me what is it my dear it's a stupid name child wife when you are going to be angry with me say to yourself it's only my child wife and i am very disappointing say i knew a long time ago that she would make but a child wife when you miss what you would like me to be and what i should like to be and what i think i never can be still my foolish child wife loves me or indeed i do i invoke the innocent figure that i dearly love to come out of the mists and shadows of the past and to turn its gentle head towards me once again and to bear witness that it was made happy by what i answered end of chapter five chapter six of david copperfield as condensed by the author for his dramatic readings in america by charles dickens this recording is in the public domain your reader michael armenta chapter six i heard a footstep on the stairs one day i knew it to be mr peggotty's it came nearer nearer rushed into the room master davy i found her i thank my heavenly father for having guided me in his own ways to my darling you have made up your mind as to the future good friend yes master davy there's mighty countries far from here our future life lays over the sea as he gave me both his hands hurrying to return to the one charge of his noble existence i thought of ham and who would break the intelligence to him mr peggotty thought of everything he had already written to the poor fellow and had the letter in the pocket of his rough coat ready for the post i asked him for it and said i would go down to yarmouth and talk to ham myself before i gave it to him and prepare him for its contents he thanked me very earnestly and we parted with the understanding that i would go down by the mail that same night in the evening i started don't you think that i asked the coachman in the first stage out of london a very remarkable sky i don't remember to have ever seen one like it nor i that's wind sir there'll be mischief done at sea before long it was a murky confusion of flying clouds tossed up into the most remarkable heaps through which the wild moon seemed to plunge headlong as if in a dread disturbance of the laws of nature she had lost her way there had been a wind all day and it was rising then with an extraordinary great sound in another hour it had much increased and the sky was more overcast and it blew hard but as the night advanced it came on to blow harder and harder many times in the dark part of the night it was then late in september we were in serious apprehension that the coach would be blown over and when the day broke the wind blew harder 
and still harder. I had been in Yarmouth when the seamen said it blew great guns, but I had never known the like of this, or anything approaching to it. As we struggled on, nearer and nearer to the sea, from which this mighty wind was blowing dead on shore, its force became more and more terrific. When we came within sight of the sea, the waves on the horizon, seemed at intervals above the rolling abyss, were like glimpses of another shore, with towers and buildings. When at last we got into the town, the people came out to their doors, making a wonder of the mail that had come through such a storm. The tremendous sea itself, when I could find pause to look at it, in the agitation of the blinding winds, the flying stones and sand, and the awful noise, confounded me. As the high watery walls came rolling in and tumbled into surf, I seemed to see a rending and upheaval of all nature. Not finding Ham among the people whom this memorable wind for it is still remembered down there as the greatest ever known to blow upon that coast, had brought together on the beach, I had made my way to his house. I learned that he had gone on a job of a shipwright's work some miles away, but that he would be back to-morrow morning, in good time. So I went back to the inn, and when I had washed and dressed, and tried to sleep, but in vain, it was late in the afternoon. I had not sat five minutes by the coffee-room fire, when the waiter, coming to stir it, told me that two colliers had gone down with all hands a few miles off, and that some other ships had been seen laboring hard in the roads, and trying, in great distress, to keep off shore. Mercy on them! and all poor sailors, said he, if we had another night like the last. I could not eat. I could not sit still. I could not continue steadfast to anything. My dinner went away almost untasted, and I tried to refresh myself with a glass or two of wine. In vain. I walked to and fro, tried to read an old gazetteer, listened to the awful noises, looked at faces, scenes, and figures in the fire. At length the ticking of the undisturbed clock on the wall tormented me to that degree that I resolved to go to bed. For hours I lay in bed, listening to the wind and water, imagining, now that I heard shrieks out at sea, now that I distinctly heard the firing of signal guns, now the fall of houses in the town. At length my restlessness attained to such a pitch that I hurried on my clothes and went downstairs. In the large kitchen, all the inn-servants and some other watchers were clustered together. One man asked me, when I went in among them, whether I thought the souls of the collier's crews who had gone down were out in the storm. I remained with these people, I dare say, two hours. Once I opened the yard-gate and looked into the empty street. The sand, the seaweed, and all the flakes of foam were driving by, and I was obliged to call for assistance before I could shut the gate again and make it fast against the wind. There was a dark gloom in my lonely chamber when I, at length, returned to it. But I was tired now, and getting into bed again, fell into the depths of sleep until broad day, when I was aroused at eight or nine o'clock by someone knocking and calling at my door. What's the matter? A wreck, close by. What wreck? A schooner from Spain or Portugal, laden with fruit and wine. Make haste, sir, if you want to see her. It's thought down on the beach she'll go to pieces every moment. I wrapped myself in my clothes as quickly as I could, 
and ran into the street where numbers of people were before me all running in one direction to the beach i ran the same way not stripping a good many and soon came facing the wild sea every appearance it had before presented bore the expression of being swelled and the height to which the breakers rose and bore one another down and rolled in in interminable hosts was most appalling in the difficulty of hearing anything but wind and waves and in the crowd and the unspeakable confusion and my first breathless efforts to stand against the weather i was so confused that i looked out to sea for the wreck and saw nothing but the foaming heads of the great waves a boatman laid a hand upon my arm and pointed then i saw it close in upon us one mast was broken short off six or eight feet from the deck and lay over the side entangled in a maze of sail and rigging and all that ruin as the ship rolled and beat which she did with a violence quite inconceivable beat the side as if it would stave it in some efforts were being made to cut this portion of the wreck away for as the ship which was broadside on turned towards us in her rolling i plainly descried her people at work with axes especially one active figure with long curling hair but a great cry audible even above the wind and water rose from the shore the sea sweeping over the wreck made a clean breach and carried men spars casks planks bulwarks heaps of such toys into the boiling surge the second mast was yet standing with the rags of a sail and the wild confusion of broken cordage flapping to and fro the ship had struck once the same boatman said and then lifted in and struck again i understood him to add that she was parting amidships as he spoke there was another great cry of pity from the beach four men arose with the wreck out of the deep clinging to the rigging of the remaining mast uppermost the active figure with the curling hair there was a bell on board and as the ship rolled and dashed this bell rang and its sound the knell of those unhappy men was borne towards us on the wind again we lost her and again she rose two of the four men were gone i noticed that some new sensation moved the people on the beach and i saw them part and ham come breaking through them to the front instantly i ran to him for i divined that he meant to wade off with a rope i held him back with both arms and implored the men not to listen to him not to let him stir from that sand another cry rose and we saw the cruel sail with blow on blow beat off the lower of the two men and fly up in triumph round the active figure left alone upon the mast against such a sight and against such determination as that of the calmly desperate man who was already accustomed to lead half the people present i might as hopefully have entreated the wind i was swept away to some distance where the people around me made me stay urging as i confusedly perceived that he was a bent on going with help or without, and that I should endanger the precautions for his safety by troubling those with whom they rested. I saw hurry on the beach, and men running with ropes and penetrating into a circle of figures that hid him. Then I saw him standing alone, in a seaman's frock and trousers, a rope in his hand, another round his body, and several of the best men holding to the latter. The wreck was breaking up. I saw that she was parting in the middle, and that the life of the solitary man upon the mast hung by a thread. He had a singular red cap on, not like a sailor's cap, 
but of a finer colour and as the few planks between him and destruction rolled and bulged and as his death knell rung he was seen by all of us to wave this cap i saw him do it now and thought i was going distracted when his action brought the old remembrance to my mind of a once dear friend the once dear friend steer forth ham watched the sea until there was a great retiring wave when he dashed in after it and in a moment was buffeting with the water rising with the hills falling with the valleys lost beneath the foam borne on towards the ship at length he neared the wreck he was so near that with one more of his vigorous strokes he would be clinging to it when a high green vast hillside of water moving on shoreward from beyond the ship he seemed to leap up into it with a mighty bound and the ship was gone they drew him to my very feet insensible dead he was carried to the nearest house and every means of restoration was tried but he had been beaten to death by the great wave and his generous heart was stilled for ever as i sat beside the bed when hope was abandoned and all was done a fisherman who had known me when emily and i were children and ever since whispered my name at the door sir will you come over yonder the old remembrance that had been recalled to me was in his look and i asked him has a body come ashore yes do i know it he answered nothing but he led me to the shore and on that part of it where she and i had looked for shells two children on that part of it where some lighter fragments of the old boat blown down last night had been scattered by the wind among the ruins of the home he had wronged i saw him lying with his head upon his arm as i had often seen him lie at school End of chapter six End of David Copperfield as condensed by the author for his dramatic readings in America